Question 11, we're talking about straight chain um, chloroalkanes. So we've got seven carbon chains, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's saying, well, how many different isomers with just one chlorine in there are chiral? So if we consider the possibilities, if we put the chlorine on the end, then that's not going to be chiral because that carbon has two hydrogens attached, so that one isn't chiral. Um, if we look at the next one, which has the chlorine here, then you can see that one is chiral. There's a chiral centre here because that carbon has four different things around it. It has a CH3, a chlorine, a um, butyl group, no, a pentyl group, sorry, and a um, hydrogen. So four different groups and therefore that one does have a chiral centre. And you may be able to now do this in your head once you've seen how this is going. But otherwise, just d don't worry about trying to do it in your head. Just plough on through. It doesn't take very long just to scribble these things down. Again, you can see that one is chiral because you've got chlorine, ethyl, butyl and hydrogen, four different groups around it. So there's a chiral centre there. But when we get to the next one, you can see this one isn't chiral because put the chlorine on there, but you can see because of the symmetry you've got a propyl group on that side, a three carbon chain on that side, and a three carbon chain on that side, so those two are the same, so that's not chiral. And when we carry on, the next one will be putting the chlorine there, but that's the same as that one, so that's not a different isomer, next one puts it there, but that's the same as that one. So basically we've exhausted all the possibilities, and therefore the answer is that there are only two of them that have a chiral centre, so your answer is B. Question 12 is about what happens to this compound in the uh, mass spectrometer and it's asking which uh, of these fragments gives rise to the peak of maximum intensity. So that means that the only peak we're interested in is this one and if you just read off on the scale that has an M over Z of 43. Um, so one way to approach this question is just to quickly scan down these and add up the um, relative masses. So this one comes to 44, that one comes to 42. Um, so now it couldn't be either of those. The other way you could quickly eliminate both of those though is that you couldn't get them from that molecule and if your adding up is sometimes a bit dodgy that may be the more efficient way to do it because you can see that in order to get that fragment CHCH2OH+, that's the CH2, that would be the CH, but you'd have to break that bond and that one. So you'd have to break two bonds and we know that's not a likely process so it's not going to give the most intense fragment. So you could rule that one out anyway but it has the wrong mass so so it's definitely not that one. Um, second one again has the wrong mass if you add it up it comes to 42 so it's definitely not that one but again you could see that there is no CH3, CH2, CH in that molecule, so it's not going to be that for both those reasons. Um, the last two both have the right mass, so they both add up to 43, so they are candidates in that sense. So again, it comes down to can you make them from this molecule? Uh, and you can see the bottom one, you clearly can't, because that contains a carbonyl group and there is no carbonyl group here, so it can't be that either of those or this one. So it's got to be this one, but we can just double check that that fits. And of course we've got the two CH3s and the CH there. So if we break that bond, we could get that fragment, which would give you the 43. So C is therefore the answer. Question 13 wants to know which of these are valid lines of evidence um, supporting the delocalized model for the, for the bonding in, in benzene. So this is a story you're meant to know. The evidence for the delocalised pi system in benzene is something you're very likely to get asked about. Um, so that's one of the key bits of evidence. The carbon-carbon bond lengths are all the same. And of course that's not what you would expect if you had this structure. That's what you're trying to discount and say, yeah, it's not that, it's this. And of course if it was this, you'd expect the double bonds to be uh, shorter than the single ones, so that yeah is definitely a good bit of evidence that says this is a better model. Delta H of hydrogenation, so remember the idea here is that if you react cyclohexene with hydrogen, there's cyclohexene and 
if you react with hydrogen it turns into cyclohexane and there's delta H for that now if this model was right it would really just be the equivalent of doing that same reaction three times so you would expect delta H to be that sort of amount okay so that's if we call that delta H1 this would be three times delta H1 and that's what you would be expecting if it were three localized bonds what you actually find is that it's only about twice as big so there's a much less negative number than you expect and that's because the delocalization lowers the energy of the pi electron so it takes the energy down and it means that when you add hydrogen uh, it's not as favorable as you would expect so yes that's a key bit of evidence as well and bromine reacts less readily um, with benzene than with cyclohexene that of course is true because remember you need a halogen carrier catalyst like aluminium bromide to get it to react with benzene but it just reacts with bromine water without any catalyst with that so that's definitely the case and the way we interpreted that was by saying that the delocalization reduces the density of pi electrons compared to what you would have in a localized bond so again it supports the delocalized model so all three of those things are indeed uh, important lines of evidence and therefore the uh, correct answer is A that they're all uh, important Question 14, we're asked which of these are true statements in relation to recrystallization. So you need to be able to describe uh, briefly how to do recrystallization, but this is asking you to think a little bit about how it works. Remember, the, the method is that first you dissolve your impure compound in a minimum amount of hot solvent, and then you cool the solvent down. So that one is clearly true, because you dissolve in a minimum amount of hot solvent, and then you cool it down. Now, the reason you do that is this first one that you can dissolve it all when it's hot but when it cools down it becomes less soluble and therefore it crystallizes out so the whole method will only work if that one is true obviously if, if it had the same solubility when you cooled it down then it wouldn't crystallize out so the method wouldn't work so those two must be correct the melting point you just have to know this that the melting points of pure substances are always higher than those of impure substances. So you can use that as a way of, of telling whether your substance is pure if you know what the melting point's meant to be. If you measure it and find it's less than it's meant to be, that's because you've still got impurities there. So that's an important test. But of course, this has got it the wrong way around. This suggests that the melting point will be lower after purification, and that's clearly not the case. Um, so only the first two are correct, and therefore the answer is B. Question 15 is asking us about this compound and it gives us um, three things that could react with this and saying, well, which of them would react with it specifically to form a carbon-carbon bond? So not just which would react with it, but when they react, do they form a carbon-carbon bond? So the first one is uh, chloromethane and aluminium chloride. As soon as you see that combination of uh, a, a haloalkane or a... Um, or an acyl chloride with aluminium chloride you think Friedel Crafts so yes it can react with the ring and when it does that it forms a carbon carbon bond so for example you might make that compound sorry you should write it like this shouldn't you so that the carbons attached to the ring so you could make that compound uh, replacing the chlorine of the uh, CH3Cl with the benzene ring. So for the CH3Cl one with aluminium chloride the answer is yes it can form a carbon-carbon bond. Uh, the second one it answers, asks us about is KCN in ethanol. Well you should know that that's the recipe for using uh, cyanide as a nucleophile to displace a, a halogen. So in other words it would be this reaction sorry with CN minus remember attacking a carbon to boot out the halogen like that and of course the consequence of that is that what you end up with is indeed a new carbon carbon bond because the bromine is gone and you'll have CN there instead so yes that one can also form a carbon carbon bond so that was KCN and ethanol the answer is yes the third one is asking about methanol 
and sulfuric acid. That combination should make you think esterification. Acid catalyst and an alcohol could react with the carboxylic acid, so you may be tempted to go for that one. But remember that when that reacts with methanol, okay, here's methanol, then what happens is that you eliminate water from there, and so you lose the OH from here, and you lose the hydrogen from there, and the new bond that you form is not a carbon-carbon bond, it's a carbon-oxygen bond. So although it reacts, that was a slight trick, because it reacts not to form a carbon-carbon bond. So CH3OH and um, sulfuric acid does react, but not to form a carbon-carbon bond, so no for that one. And therefore only one and two are correct, so the answer is B.